Welcome to the uh, Breaking Into Yacht Brokerage course for this evening. It's Friday, it's six o'clock. And uh, before I actually really get down to it, I just want to make sure that uh, you can all hear me okay. So if you're listening in and you can leave a message, I'd, uh, I'd appreciate that. Just uh, write a little comment in the section there at the side. It always takes a little while for those comments to come through because there's a lag between the time that I start to actually talk to the camera to the time that it um that you receive it and so there's always a few seconds uh, before i can get any comments had no comments yet but i can see there are some people watching so i'll, I'll get started uh in any case first of all with some quick uh, housekeeping uh if you've watched this before you'll know that i start with just a 10 to 15 minute discussion oh thank you very much andrea panelli says hi from italy so i know that i know that you can hear me and it's all working correctly um yeah so first some housekeeping uh, as you probably know i always start these courses with just a 10 minute explanation of some useful tips to how to break into the yacht brokerage business um after which uh, i invite you to ask any questions that you'd like it's great if the questions are relevant to what we've been talking about but very often people just like to ask all kinds of questions you're very very welcome to do that super chats are welcome uh, any question that's accompanied by a super chat i absolutely guarantee i'll give you the most thorough answer i possibly can um, but in any case your questions are most welcome so let's get started and in the previous courses that we did were about breaking into the yacht brokerage industry. In the first course, we discussed the fact that if you want to be a yacht broker, you really do need to be in a part of the world where there are yachts. And we talked about practical ways that you can maybe move to an area where there are yachts without having to break the bank uh, in doing so. And at the end of that particular course, we said that there are four, there are, sorry, three groups of people who mostly ask me about becoming a yacht broker. You've got the first group is the complete starter. That is to say people who have just done maybe their first year of work or have maybe just left university and they're thinking, what do I want to do with my life? And they'd love to be a yacht broker. We discussed that group last week and we gave some really good practical uh, advice for them. This week, we'll be looking at the second group which is basically the dissatisfied worker. That is to say, people who've had a job for quite a while, they may even be in their 30s, 40s or 50s or more, and they're just not happy with the way their life's going. And they look at the yacht brokerage business and they think, if only I could get into that. That's the group we'll be looking at today. And then next week, we'll be looking at the third group of people, which are actually just people who are really ambitious career builders. They may be actually quite happy with what they are doing with their their business and their work but they want to do something even better and they see yacht brokerage as the next step on the ladder for them we'll be looking at that next week just very briefly last week something really important that we said because we'll be picking up on it this week is that if you are fresh out of university fresh out of school you're just starting up in your work life you may go for an interview at a yacht brokerage company thinking that you have a degree in a certain subject which is relevant and hoping that will get you the job. The bad news is uh, it won't. And uh, it's not really what brokerage companies are looking for when they interview for a yacht broker. Uh, what they are looking for, four points, relevant connections. They want a yacht broker who knows yacht owners, or at the very least, yacht captains, who's well connected in the industry. The second thing, Obviously, they're looking for a yacht broker who has some knowledge of the industry and of yachts themselves. The third thing they're looking for, of course, is a proven ability to network. Will you be able to continue building on your connections? And the fourth thing is a successful experience in sales, of course, is useful. When we were talking about the complete starter who's just starting up their life looking for work, um, we looked at ways that uh, somebody who's maybe just arrived in an area where there are yachts can start to accumulate those four things, how they can start to build up their connections, build up their knowledge of yachts and build upon um, their networking abilities. So this week, 
We're talking about people who are a little bit further along in their life, and that is to say the dissatisfied worker, the, uh, I don't know, the accountant from Michigan who, who wants something more exciting in his life, or, or the, sale, the car salesman from Wolverhampton who wants to sell yachts. Uh, people who, they've got a job, but they want something even more exciting, and that's completely understandable. Um, so what can we do to help people like that to break into the yacht brokerage industry? Well, the first thing that you need to do is, again, remember those four points that will make you successful as a broker. You need to have connections, relevant connections. You need knowledge of yachts and the, uh, the yachting industry. You need a good ability to network and a successful experience in sales. Now, different to the complete starter, some of those things you'll already have. So what I'd encourage you to do is to look at your skill set. In the years that you've worked, what skills have you developed, first of all? And then figure out how you can use those skills to penetrate into the yachting industry. You need to face the fact that you probably won't immediately be offered the job as a yacht broker. You won't. So you need the strategy of taking steps along the way where eventually you will get a job as a yacht broker. And if you've got some skill sets, there's different ways that you can do that. Um, I've made a few examples here, and you'll see these examples in the notes in the description below afterwards. But for example, if you're in sales and marketing, and I think most people who want to get into brokerage have some background in sales and marketing, don't turn your no nose up at the opportunity to work for a company that sells jet skis or ribs or tenders. The fact that somebody's buying a jet ski isn't necessarily because they can't afford a yacht. In fact, often the opposite is true. Um, people who are buying jet skis are buying it because uh, they have a yacht. And it's a wonderful way to start building up your connections, talking to people. It may be that the yacht owner doesn't buy the tender or the rib. In fact, it's probable that they won't, but they'll send their captain, they'll send their chief engineer and so you're making connections, you're making clients, you're starting to network and you're starting to get onto that, uh, onto that route. The example of the jet skis may be a particularly obvious one. So I want to give you a few other less obvious examples too of jobs you could target um, which will help you on the route to becoming a yacht broker. And I've made a note that there's two particular businesses which are, in my opinion, really lousy at sales and marketing. And that is yacht management companies and yacht refit yards. And I apologize to anybody in a yacht management company who has a yacht refit yard. I especially apologize to my friend, Stuart Parvin, who is the exception to the rule. He has a refit yard and he's actually brilliant at marketing and sales. But as a general rule, refit yards and yacht management companies are really not good uh, at all. So if you have a skill set in sales and marketing, it may be good to approach all of those companies and to see what you can do for them. Now, obviously, some knowledge of yachts is necessary if you're going to represent a refit yard or a yacht management company. So it may be that you just have to limit yourself to be an introducer to go to all of the various yachts, introduce yourselves to them, Tell them about the services of the refit yard or the yacht management company and just work those contacts, work them and meet people and learn on your feet as you go along. Uh, just so that, you know, I think it's probably quite obvious what a refit yard is along. Well, in most areas where there are yachts, there are also shipyards that just do repairs to yachts or completely refit them. Um, that one's fairly obvious. A yacht management company, on the other hand, uh, you may not have heard of. A yacht management company is a company that has a small fleet of yachts and they'll handle, for example, payroll and safety issues and even quite small issues. If the yacht's away somewhere and they need to get refueled, they might call the yacht management company to find the closest place where they can get refueled. It's um, a good yacht management company will offer a 360 degree service to yachts just to take a bit of the pressure off of the captain and, and they work very closely with the captains. So are you great at social media? Hit these people, tell them what you can do for them, come up with a strategy as to how you can help them. Um, 
with their social media, with their, their sales. If you do that, you can at least get your foot into the yachting industry, build a reputation, build your connections, build, build upon um, your career, really. So that then when you go to a brokerage company and ask for an interview, at least you've got some of the requisites they're looking for. Now, what about people who aren't um, in sales and marketing? What about our accountant in Michigan that we mentioned earlier on? Clearly, for somebody who's not um, in sales and marketing in the first place, you're at a disadvantage because your brokerage is a sales and marketing job. But don't let it put you off. If you really are determined to become a broker and you don't view yourself as a salesperson, don't be put off. A lot of the best brokers that I know are not overt, gift of the gab salespeople. A lot of you really great yacht brokers are really great because they listen to people and because they offer a very good service and they bring in other people with other skill sets to help them to get yachts sold and to find yachts that can be sold. So your accountant, talk to all of these various companies that support um, the yachting industry about whether you can help them with their accounts. There are businesses that have crew uniforms that help need uh, assistance in their uh, in their warehouses there are all kinds of different jobs it's up to you to look at your skill set that you have and say how can i offer that skill set to some business that's somehow associated with the yachting industry and then when you've got in start networking start building your connections start developing your knowledge of yachting so that that day that you do go for an interview as a yacht broker you can really talk with some authority. Now, before I go to questions, I'm going to tell you about a hack, how to hack in to becoming a yacht broker. And it's something that most people have never thought of, but I guarantee you it can bring really good success. And again, it's in the description below. Um, all of the large yacht brokerage companies have what's called a listings department. Now, a listings department has a very, very specific job. It's the intelligence department of the yacht brokerage. And their job, eight hours, 10 hours or more a day, is to find out what's going on in the industry by reading the news, by telephoning other brokerage companies, by analysing the market. Um, I, I have a fantastic intelligence tool behind the yacht brokerage that I work with. Uh, so that I can know at any time what's for sale, how much uh, the asking price is, whether the asking price has been reduced from here to there or whether it's gone up, how long it's been on the market for. Um, I can get access to specifications, how many hours are on the engines of that yacht. And I can do that because I have a very, very good intelligence tool behind me. And, and most large yacht brokerages have people working full time for the brokers to get all of that intelligence together. I know scores of people who approach yacht brokerages because they want to be a yacht broker. I've never heard of anybody approaching a yacht brokerage to offer to work in the listings department. And yet it is the best fast track to becoming a yacht broker that I can think of. Because if you're smart and which I'm sure you are, by the way. If you're smart, while you're working in the listings department and you're getting all of this market intelligence and you're phoning other brokers and you're analysing what's happening to prices on yachts, you'll be communicating this to the brokers in the company that you're working for. You'll be developing a relationship with those brokers. I know, in fact, one friend of mine, that's exactly how he became a broker, from working in the listings department to eventually the, some of the brokers would take him out on visits to yachts so that he could actually see you know, exactly what was going on. And for him, when it was time to transition from listings department to broker, it was the most natural thing in the world and he's now very successful. So that's my hack for you. Um, consider that. Consider approaching yacht brokerage companies and offering to work in their listings department because it's a great fast track uh, to becoming uh, a broker. So that basically is it for the second part of the course, which was to uh, assist the dissatisfied worker. If you're a dissatisfied worker, that indicates that you have worked, you do have some experience of work. Look at what your skill set is, whether it's sales and marketing accounts or, or whatever it may be, 
and try to get into a yacht related business that can use that skill set. Then once you're in the yacht related business, you can start to work on the other prerequisites that will help you to become a broker in the future. In essence, that's the, uh, the substance of this part of the course. Now, let's have a look at some of the comments that we've been getting. And if you watch this regularly, you'll know that um, unfortunately the, uh, the, the comments sometimes are out of sync with my presentation. Um, and actually, yeah, first of all, I'll do this. Then I've got a little message for you that I want to give to you. Uh, just want to give a shout out to some of the people who are watching. Joachim Barkstrom. Hi from Sweden. Hi, Joachim. Charles Fossorier from Paris. Merakuk, I remember you here last week as well. Good to see you here again. Emanuele Di Mari, who, by the way, is already in the yachting industry and very, uh, very well known in the industry. Um, thanks for being here again. Jose Ferreira, hello from Panama. Wow, it's so great to hear where people are from. I'll just say a couple of other names before I give you an important message. Um, Paul from Northumberland. Nice to hear from you, Paul. Um, before I answer JP Batu's question, um, last week there was a question I couldn't answer and I felt terrible because I felt I should have been able to answer it. And so I said I'd look into it for this week. And that question was, why is it that some yachts are listed as not for sale to US residents in US waters? And I knew in the back of my head what the answer was and it wasn't coming to me. But basically the answer to that, which you'll see from time to time that some yachts are not for sale to US residents in US waters. It goes back to a very old law that you can't sell a foreign flagged vessel in the United States. So you can sail a foreign flag vessel in the United States, but you can't sell it while you're there. So if you see that not for sale to US residents in US waters, it's because it will be a foreign flagged vessel. Um, there is a fantastic article about it um, on a website called Yacht Harbour. I haven't done it yet, but I will copy and paste the link to that in the description below. And it gives you a real thorough answer to that question. So I can't remember who asked it. I'm sorry I wasn't able to answer it last week, but I'm answering it now. So let's get on with some questions. Um, JP Batu, does it make sense to list the boat on websites, Facebook pages? Absolutely, yes, it does. Um, more and more people are using social media like Facebook and even Instagram um, to, to buy their yachts. And, and it shouldn't be a surprise that people who own yachts, enjoy looking at yacht related content online, whether that's a, a website or Instagram. I actually had a very good inquiry this week through Instagram. I mean, it's, it's led nowhere, but it was a qualified individual um, who contacted me about a yacht that I have for sale that was on Instagram. So yeah, absolutely makes sense to list them both on websites and Facebook pages. Um, moving on down. Jerry says, hi from the Great Lakes of Ontario, Canada. That must be a beautiful place. Stevens Ottero from South Africa, also a beautiful country. Felix Henderson. Hi, David. Given the current situation with COVID-19, I would imagine that owners and prospective charterers are desperate to get on board. Could this potentially trigger an increase in hiring? You're talking about hiring as crew, I think. Um, I'm not sure about crew. I think most crew that I talk to are pretty secure in their jobs because um, it hasn't, the, the COVID-19, as awful as it is, it hasn't gone on long enough yet for people to have laid off their crews. I think we're going to see yachts for sale where owners are like a little bit worried about the, the world economy. And so um, that will obviously uh, result in some movement. I think as well, I think some yacht brokerages are going to find it very, very difficult to survive this year. I really do. And from the brokerage perspective, that may give an opportunity to people to come into the industry as brokers. Um, but as I've said before on this live stream, be aware it's a high risk, high reward uh, business. You know, I want to offer people help who want to become a yacht broker, but with your eyes open that it's a very, very risky business. Uh, Scott 
Now's bow. This might be a dumb question. What's the difference between a broker and a yacht salesman? Um, there's really, it's not a dumb question, actually. Um, it's a good question. Uh, there are, in the world of yachts, there are yacht brokers and there are yacht dealers. A yacht dealer will have an exclusive contract with a company like Azimut or Sunseeker or Ferretti, production yacht companies, where they're given a territory and their main responsibility is to sell brand new yachts from that builder. If I'm a Sunseeker dealer, um, I can't go out selling new princesses or fair lines. I mean, I probably could, but Sunseeker would take a very dim view of it. And I'm also supposed to stay within my territory. So people would have to either, if, for example, if I was a dealer in France, either the yacht would have to be kept in France or the client would have to come from France. It's, it's um, you're really, really tied in what you do. But on the other hand, you have, if somebody wants to buy a brand new Sunseeker and they're in France, they have to go to you. A broker, on the other hand, is somebody who looks to put a buyer and a seller together, whether that's in any country in the world, any product, any yacht product in the world, they're trying to bring the two people together uh, to make a deal happen. So that's basically the difference. And I would say that a dealer is more a salesman, a broker is more there to broker a deal, to bring two parties together. Kindly Silver, hello David, hello Kindly. Do you prefer express yachts like Mangusta and Leopard or a Trideck slow yacht like a Trinity and Fedship? Um, I'm 54 years old, so although I don't feel it, and you're supposed to now say you don't look it, but I think at this stage in life, I would be wiser buying a Trideck because um, I think the Mangusta and Leopard are fantastic yachts. I think they look great, but um, I'm at a point in my life now where I'd like to have lots of friends and family on board, and the more space you have, the better that is. And those bigger Tridecks offer more space and honestly, um, I love the speed, I really do, but I'd rather spend the money on, on more volume. That's just me though. GV, thanks for the answer about the question about last week. My pleasure, GV. Uh, Felix Henderson says, for brokers, I'm not sure why you've said that. I'm sure I've missed something. Um, Clint Brown, hey David, hello from the US. Which yacht is your dream yacht? Uh, you're going to be disappointed. I mean, I'll tell you what it is, but you will be disappointed. Uh, my my dream is very, very modest indeed. Uh, my dream is to have a, a house in Fort Lauderdale and to have tied up at the back of the house an intrepid 375. It's not a spectacular yacht. I just think it's a great boat. It does everything I would want. I could get across the Bahamas, down to the Keys. Uh, I could drive it myself. Uh, that's kind of my honest dream at the moment. I should do hashtag not sponsored because I don't do any business with Intrepid, but I just very much like their boats. Um, Michael Ann, what do you think is the future market of yachts? What do you think is the future market of yachts would treat yacht designers? I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that. But um, if you're talking about the future that yacht designers need to be aiming towards, um, the, all of the talk at the moment is about making yachts more eco-friendly. And I get a lot of comments on my YouTube channel saying you can never say that a yacht is eco-friendly. And I know, and I think we all know that. But the, I, I think that the fact that you can't make a motor yacht completely green doesn't mean to say that the manufacturers shouldn't try to make them um, a little bit more green than they are. And that's the way that yacht design seems to be going um, on the whole. They seem to be looking at more sustainable materials. BB, David, from your experience, how is commission structured in yacht brokerage? I think what I, you know, I thought sooner or later somebody would ask this question. We go into it in detail further on in the course, but I'm very happy to tell you now as well. Uh, you say, for example, as a percentage of sales price, what does a typical broker and salesman earn? Now, great question. Um, in yacht brokerage, which is where you're talking about um, a, a pre-owned or a used yacht, the standard commission 
is 10% up to the first 10 million euro or dollars in its value. Now that sounds like a lot. And, and one may think, oh, well, if he's got a $5 million yacht, he's going to make half a million commission. You need to know this. If you're listening to the course because you're seriously interested in being a yacht broker, you need to know this. It doesn't work that way. Um, let's take the $5 million yacht for an example. First of all, nobody ever pays full asking price. Nobody does. Uh, so uh, you might sell it for four and a half million. So now the commission is 450,000. Secondly, it's very, very rare that you um, will be able to sell the yacht yourself. More often than not, you may have the seller, but another broker has the buyer. So now you have to split the commission between yourself and another broker. And usually, but not always, it's 60-40 in favour of who has the buyer. So if you represent the seller of, and the commission is 450,000, um, you get 40% of that, which is 180,000. Now, that 180,000, you then have to split with the brokerage company that you're working with. And that may be, depending on the conditions that you come to with your brokerage company, it may be as much as half. So now you've made 90,000 and it may be the only yacht that you sell all year and you have to pay tax on that as well. So, you know, the idea that all yacht brokers are just raking in hundreds and hundreds of thousands here, there and everywhere is absolutely not true. There are some incredibly successful yacht brokers who make a lot of money, um, but it's, it's not as easy as it looks. So thanks for the question. It's really valuable information. We've had a super chat. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rudy Degelt. Um, super chats, I'm always going to prioritise, which I think is only fair. Also, because I think that this um, information I'm giving out is of, of really some value. Uh, so let's have a look at what Rudy wants to know. Hello, David. I think of the yacht Cecilia. How is it possible that a yacht of this quality, I saw your video, can be sold at half the price? New, does this hide a defect? Should we be wary? Okay, so Cecilia is the wider... 165, uh, which was launched, I think, two years ago. And it was launched at a time when Wider was in some turmoil. Uh, the founder of Wider um, left the company. Uh, when you first build a yacht with a new brand, you have to take on board that you'll be hit with certain losses. It's unlikely that you'll make money on the first yacht or even the second yacht that you sell. And why do we going through that pain period um, at the time? I, I don't think that's a secret. I think most people uh, know that that's the case. The wider 165 they built was fantastic. I just absolutely brilliant, but they were still having to invest heavily in building up the brand. And it was at a time when the market was still very, 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 very slow. Um, the founder of the company, left. There wasn't immediately uh, a new management put into place. Um, so the, the, that, that yacht was surrounded with a lot of very, very difficult circumstances. Then on top of that, if you launch a yacht and you don't have, and it's not being used by an owner with a, and I need to be careful what I say here, but with a, with a yacht crew, the value of the yacht will go down. It just will. And, you know, Wider did a fantastic job. The crew that they put on board were very good, very professional. They worked for the shipyard. But there's something about having an owner on board with his own crew and he's always looking at everything. It just keeps keeps the yacht in a slightly better condition. So in no time at all, um, unfortunately, the, the value of Cecilia dropped. Also, in my opinion... And I'd say this now, if the guys from Wider were here in front of me, they, they made a very, very poor commercial decision of taking the yacht back to Ancona, when actually the the shop window for yachts is south of France and northern Italy, from let's say Genoa to Cannes, is where people go to shop. It's certainly not Ancona. Um, so I think there was bad decisions made. Um, I don't I don't think it sold for half of the price, by the way. Um, I understand it has sold. But nobody knows the price of the yachts. Uh, the, the only people who do are the broker that sold it, the buyer and the seller. 
And I, I mentioned this last week, and, and I want to say it again, that there's an awful lot of gossip goes around in the yachting industry. And it's not always from brokers. Sometimes it's from owners who will say, I know the yacht sold for this or for that. And half the time, they really don't know at all. And it's a shame because it, it gives, um, you know, a company like Wider, it, it's not good for them to hear that their yachts are being sold at half price. And, you know, that, that kind of thing can be quite damaging to a, to a company and unfairly so, because I don't know what Cecilia sold for. They might have got full price for it, or for all I know. I doubt it because most people don't pay full price, but I, I rather doubt it was half price. Um, but I hope that answers the question. No, to my knowledge, it doesn't hide a defect. Um, if, if you were looking, Rudy, to, to buy Cecilia from whoever's bought it now, um, I'd go in with great confidence. I'd get a good surveyor, of course, but that's the same with any yacht from any manufacturer. Hope that answered the question sufficiently. Uh, Charles Fossorier, I like your name, Charles Fossorier. Do you know if yachts run with their maximum crew per capacity when the owner is on board? Or do owners tend to decrease the number of crew on board to save money? Interesting question. Um, yes, uh, it varies actually. Some owners pack the crew quarters with everybody they possibly can because they want a very high level of service and they don't care what it costs. Um, some fly in with their own personal chef uh, and then, you know, that, that chef is just used, takes up one of the bunks in one of the crew cabins. Others do want to save money. And, um, you know, some yacht owners of even sizable yachts like to get stuck in themselves. Um, I know of one particular family of yacht owners where up until not too long ago, uh, the, the children in the family were told to help the crew wash the yacht down, which I thought was fantastic. A great way to teach rich kids how to have a you know well-grounded outlook on life so it really it really varies Charles um what most yacht owners in the med do is they'll have the full crew for three to four months of the year and then they'll lay the crew off for the rest of the year because they're not using the yacht so maybe the captain and one other will stay on all year round and that might sound harsh on the crew is actually not because a lot of crew are very, very happy to work those three, four months, save all their money and then go skiing or or touring the world for the rest of the year. It's a wonderful lifestyle. Um, and if they're really good and if the owner likes them, they'll also offer them a retainer to come back for the next year. <laughs> Rudy says he's in love with Cecilia. Cecilia, there was a Simon and Garfunkel song about Cecilia. And I almost started singing it then, but I won't. Uh, Scott Nausbaum, is there a license similar to real estate you need to become a broker? Yes, there is in the United States. The Florida Yacht Broker Association um, requires you to have a license. Uh, not in the med. And I wish there was because it's terribly unregulated. And sometimes you feel like you're in the Wild West here in the med um, because of the lack of regulations and the lack of licenses. I think, but I may be wrong, in Italy, you need to be licensed because they have something called a Mediatore Maritimo, um, which is like a proper official mediator of maritime things. And you need to have qualifications for that. But otherwise, no license required in the med. Judas Tamad, Tamad, Sir David, I have a question for you. What if I refer to you, a potential buyer of a yacht, and he made a deal to buy it? Can I get commission? Thank you. Great questions today. Um, that happens. That happens that you get introduced to a buyer and they buy a yacht and the broker would pay a part of this commission to the introducer. What's important is that everything is done with transparency. Um, it's important from an ethical standpoint. So... Um, let's say, Judas, that your boss was looking to buy a yacht and you say, oh, I watch this guy's YouTube channel. You know, he can sort you out. And then you send an email to me and say, my boss is going to call you. I want you know, a percentage of your commission. I'm fine with that as long as your boss is fine with that. I can't do deals under the table. Um, I, I won't from an ethical standpoint, but also um, particularly in the Med, actually, the, the importance of anti-money laundering laws and lack of bribery is essential. And brokers are under the magnifying glass for our ethics and our handling of financial matters. So 
transparency is absolutely key. I'm very happy to work with introducers so long as all parties involved know uh, that there was an introducer and the introducer's getting paid. Uh, Devco, Devco, hi David, do you have a skipper's license? No, I'm, I don't. And I'd love to learn to sail and I'd love to learn to, uh, to, to basically drive a boat. I can't even tie a knot, Devco, Devco. It's a, a, a dirty little secret that I have. I can't even tie a knot. Uh, but I will one day learn, and maybe I should do a series of YouTube channels, uh, YouTube videos about that as well. Um, BB, David, regarding owner operator yachts, how much of your brokerage business in percentage would you guess is generated by owner operator yachts in the 20 to 25 meter range versus crude at 30 plus meters? My business is 0% owner operated 20 to 25 meter range. There are other yacht brokers who, um, have great success with that. It kind of relates back to the fact that I, I can't operate a yacht myself. I um, And I think that an owner operator would want to be talking to somebody who could operate a yacht. My forte is in marketing and my forte is in marketing yachts from the say 30 to 60 meter range. Um, and my forte as well is that I have a very, very good network of, of people who, who come together and form a good team to help people to, to sell those yachts in that range. But 20 to 25 meter owner operated, that's not my, that's not my thing really. Um, Michael McClear, why are some yachts not for sale in USA waters? Michael, um, you've tuned in late. I answered that question. Um, so what I'd say is once the live stream is finished um it takes i think it takes a little while actually but there will be a recording of this left online that you'll be able to listen to and also i'm going to put a link after the live stream in the description below to a website which gives a really thorough and complete answer to that question but thanks for the question carlos paredes good afternoon mr seal congratulations for your amazing channel thank you carlos Please tell me about Solo. I love that video. Do you think the price will drop, will drop to $55 million due to the financial crisis? No sign of a price drop just yet. It's had one small price drop, but there's uh, there's no sign of a further price drop just yet. Um, and if there was, I don't think the owner would thank me for, <laughs> for giving a heads up on it. But genuinely, there's no there's no sign of a price drop. This, the, the owner of that yacht, he can afford to wait so that the right person comes along who can make the right offer. It's not a distress sale at all. It's doing very well on charter. And actually that kind of surprises me because it's a lovely yacht. And if somebody is seriously looking to buy it and they looked at the charter record, they'd realize that the running costs can be very, very well contained just by keeping it on the charter market. We've had another super chat. Thank you very much. Daniel, Daniel Duarte Javo. Thank you once again. Uh, I thought you had a question. You're just giving me a $50 super chat saying, sorry, I'm late. Thanks for this. Thank you, Daniel. I really do appreciate it. It's, um, it's, it's very, very kind of you. Very generous. Uh, just a reminder, questions with super chats will always get priority and they'll always get a more thorough uh, answer. Uh, Patrick, Patrick, how are you? Nice to hear from you on the on the live stream. Patrick says, do David watch from the car driving through Germany on the way back to Zurich? <laughs> yes, you sent me a video, I think, of you driving. I did. I'm sorry I didn't reply to that uh, message from you. I did watch it and it's fantastic. And I got your other messages and I will reply. So um, sorry about that. It's been a, a pretty hectic week because I'm trying to get some video content out and I've hit a few challenges this week, but we got over them. Uh, I'm not even going to try to say this name, but it's nine. It starts nine one nine. It's a load of numbers. It's probably somebody's telephone number. What do you think of sailing super yachts? I love them. I and I'm so happy that people are still prepared to build them, um, as few as they are. I, I love sailing yachts. A. Eh? I love Sea Eagle too. Um, Black Swan. You know, there's just these really large sailing super yachts are some of the most spectacular yachts in the world today. So yeah, love them. 
Um, Brian Drefke. Hey, David, I was here last week. I remember your name. Uh, great videos. What's your best piece of advice for someone wanting to break into the business? Brian. Um, thanks for the question. The whole live stream is really full of advice. Uh, what I'd recommend is that you go back to the recording of the first one, which is simply called, I think, Breaking Into Yacht Brokerage. The second one is recorded, and this third one as well will uh, remain as a recording that you'll be able to, to listen to, and it's packed full of good advice. Uh, maybe the best piece of advice, actually, if that's specifically what you're asking, the best piece of advice was the advice that I gave a few moments ago, was that the quickest fast track to becoming a broker is got by approaching brokerage companies to work in their listings departments. People don't seem to want to do it, and yet it's an interesting job. You'll learn a lot, you'll make great connections, and it'll put you in a good position to then uh, transition to becoming a broker. Uh, Charles Fossorier, thanks for your reply. Would you say that the bigger the yacht, the less an owner will be likely to put it on the charter market? Not at all. No, no. there's no hard, hard and fast rule. There's only less large yachts on charter market on the charter market than there are on the sales market because there's less less of them that exist. Um, but actually, the larger yachts seem to get absolutely booked out on charter because there's a lack of them then i suppose it's market demand um you know i mean quite literally if you were to buy a 140 meter yacht and spend half a billion on it and put it on the charter market you could almost guarantee that you'd be booked out with charter it's really quite remarkable the way that it works um flying medic cordially invites me to dinner in mayfair but you've been too busy to join me. I hope you can soon. Thanks, Paul. That's very, very kind of you. Uh, let's keep in touch. And I'd love to meet you for dinner in, in Mayfair, hopefully when the social distancing stopped a little bit. Uh, I have to be honest, and I guess a lot of you are the same. I just can't wait for restaurants to open up again and, and bars. Uh, it's one of the great things about being in Italy is all the restaurants and bars. And uh, I'm starting to miss that quite badly. Uh, no, Kenny Fi, what filter do you use on YouTube videos? You're more handsome live. Oh, thank you so much. I, I do appreciate that. Nobody's ever called me handsome before. Um, actually, we do use a filter. I don't know what it is. I have a video team and they're fantastic because they really are part of the team. They have their own independent company called Movie, but they, they are very much a part of this YouTube channel. And Ricky, who's one of the, the team, very much wanted this green wall behind me to be um, the blue colour that's on my logo. And so he uses a filter to make that wall blue somehow. And I, I guess it also affects my my face. I, I was I was going to paint that wall blue at Christmas and I was just too lazy to do it. But one day you will see it painted blue. Not anytime soon, but one day you will. Uh, working my way through just want to make sure i haven't missed any super chats if oh the ones coming just literally as i said that gib thank you very much gib first of all thanks very much for the super chats greetings david i know less than nothing about boats and sailing etc however i was wondering what wood other than teak could be used on deck as i find teak ugly as all heck thanks a million be safe and healthy um i did a video about a substitute teak that the yacht builder Lurson have been very much instrumental in developing. I don't remember the name of the video, but if you go to my channel afterwards and use the little search feature on my channel and put in Lurson, which is L-U-R-S-S-E-N, and I filmed it at the Fort Lauderdale Boat Show, and I think it might have even been called Lurson at Fort Lauderdale, there's all the information about this amazing wood that's not teak. It's resin infused. It's like a molecularly infused with resin. It's harder wearing. It's far, far more sustainable because, as you probably know, teak is an endangered wood. Um, and the wood that they're using is not endangered. And, and actually, um, there's all kinds of research going on right now to find alternatives to teak. Not because people find it ugly. Um, you're actually one of the first people I've heard say that, but of course you're, 
Um, you know, everybody finds different things uh, ugly and different things beautiful. Um, but that's not the reason people are looking for alternatives. They're looking because teak is disappearing from the from from the planet, and so we need to look after it. The other thing that, um, particularly with fiberglass production yachts, some people prefer just to keep the fiberglass, the white fiberglass uh, on deck. They put like a little special grid pattern on it, which makes it anti-skid. And um, a lot of people are, are quite happy to have that. And it's not always just because they don't want to spend the money on teak. Sometimes it's because they genuinely prefer that look. So there's not a lot of wood alternatives. There's one, it's been developed by uh, the investment of Lurson and, and another company as well. There's also a an artificial teak, the name of which escapes me. <clears throat> but I talk about it in one of my videos that I did for Icon, excuse me, or I'll just take a slurp of water from this massively oversized bottle. Um, so, yeah, if you look at uh, the video I did of Icon as well, that talks about an artificial tea. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much indeed for the super chat. That's much appreciated. Um, working my way down the questions. BB, are you familiar with the 82 meter 2004 Omega built by Golden Yachts? It's been on the market for a very long time, but it seems like a great value at 40 million euro. And I'm curious if I know why. Excuse me. <coughs> Another swig of water. I do know the yachts. I don't think I've ever been on board. But I do know the yacht. It's a very distinctive looking yacht. Um, so how can I give you a very honest answer to, to this? First of all, there's a limited market for 82 meter yachts, of course. Generally speaking, the Germans and the Dutch um, command a premium. And there's a reason for that. When they produce um, an 82 meter yacht or bigger, the quality is absolutely outstanding it's as close to perfection as you can possibly get now that's not to say that greek builders <coughs> excuse me or turkish builders um, who tend to be far low down the scale in terms of prices don't produce a, a perfectly good product you know you, you can still go out enjoy the yacht their design is wonderful they can look fantastic they're seaworthy um, and some people are happy with that and they don't want to pay the premium of a, a, a Dutch or a, a German yard. So, first of all, golden yachts do come down in that less expensive category. Not to say there's anything wrong with it. 2004, that's already quite a, an old yacht. Um, I don't know enough about Omega to really comment on the condition. It may be that it needs work doing to it. I don't know. But certainly the running costs of an 82 metre yacht you, you could spend seven or eight million a year just running that yacht. And so that cuts the market down as to who can afford it even more. And so the owner might just say, well, you know what, I'm done with it. Let's you know reduce the price and get rid of it. So that's hopefully will we'll answer your question. Uh, I had a question there and then all of a sudden the, the question slipped down. So I lost it. Let me see if I can find it again. I need to scroll up. Paul Ward. Hi, David. Ever sell the yacht to an Irish customer? Yes, I have. Can't tell you who he was, but I did. Um, Clint Brown, is there a measurable difference between yacht builds in Turkey versus Italy versus US versus UK versus etc.? Um, first of all, the US, I don't think there are any or hardly any builders left. I mean, Westport, Delta are... Uh, are the two that spring to mind. So it's easier for me to talk about Italy and Turkey and the UK. Um, Italy build more yachts than almost every other country in the world put together. It's remarkable. And they do that, I think, because they offer a very good uh, price to quality ratio. The quality is excellent, um, but there's no two ways about it. It's not the quality of Lurs and Fedship 
the Germans. Um, and I honestly, and I've had this argument with Italian builders before, they're kidding themselves if they, if they want to say that it is, because it's really not. Having said that, I can't go to Germany and buy an equivalent to a 100-foot Sunseeker, Ferretti, Azimut, because they just don't build them. So the best quality that you can get is actually to go to Italy. Now, Turkey is a really interesting market to me. And if you watch my videos regularly, you'll know that I've spent quite a lot of time in Turkey visiting different shipyards. Um, the disparity between one yacht builder and another in Turkey is absolutely <laughs> unbelievable. There are some dreadful, dodgy builders in Turkey who I would never refer a client to. And there are some excellent yacht builders in Turkey who, in my opinion, are as good as any yacht builder um, in Italy, uh, building comparable yachts. Um, there's a company called Saab who um, built a lovely 46 meter, excellent quality 46 meter. Bilgin yachts are very, very interesting, producing some fantastic yachts to a very good quality and a very good price. Numerine, who um, are the smaller sector of the market in terms of the size of the yachts that they produce, are every bit as successful as, as Sunseeker, for example, and offer fantastic quality, uh, price to quality ratio. So Turkey is an interesting one. Um, you can't really talk about Turkey in general terms because there's such disparity. There's some great builders and there's some really lousy builders. I mean, truly, truly bad builders there. Uh, as well. So I guess that's where maybe a, a broker brings a little bit of value to the party because we can direct people uh, the, the right way. Um, Judas Tamad asks about mahogany, fontana and nara wood. Is that with reference to instead of teak for decks? I, I don't think you could use mahogany for teak, for, for decks, to be honest. Um, and the other two woods, I don't really know. Uh, <laughs> Mustafa's been cooking, so he's been busy, but he's still watching. Thanks, Mustafa. Uh, there, there's quite a discussion here going on about alternative woods. Ash has good rot resistance. Yellow seed is the hardest. I don't know that much about woods, to be honest. I know about marketing yachts and about brokering yachts. Oh, we've had another super chat. Almost missed that one. I do apologize. TFM Iron... Ian Yoski is your name. Hope I pronounced that right. Thank you very much indeed for the uh, for the super chat. Oh man, I w waited till seventeen fifty and then forgot about your stream. Just to see now, I missed it again. Ah, I'm sorry, but it will be. It, it, every stream that I do uh, stays on my channel as a as a completed video. Um, I don't know why it doesn't seem to appear immediately. In fact, the first stream that I did, it took almost twenty four hours before the finished video appeared on my channel. So you may need to be patient with it, but you'll be able to watch uh, back through it all. By the way, just so that you know, before I came onto this live stream, um, I was a guest on Denison Yachting's uh, virtual boat show, which is a fantastic initiative. And Denison Yachting are actually a, a big competitor to, um, to Northrop and Johnson. So it was very kind of them to invite me on the on their live stream effectively for their virtual boat show. They're great guys. Their YouTube channel is the closest competitor that I have to my YouTube channel. They have lots of great walkthrough videos. So check them out if you don't, haven't already found them. Denison Yachting, well worth checking them out. And um, when this live stream is finished, if you just haven't had enough of Yacht Talk, they're currently live streaming their virtual boat show on their Facebook page. I think they're doing it on um, on their YouTube channel too. And they're certainly doing it on the website, which is denisonyachtsales.com. Um, I just want to check something for a moment. Didn't want to have missed another live chat, another super chat. Um, so yeah, uh, do do check them out. denisonyachtsales.com. They're doing a virtual boat show all day today in, in American time. Uh, Annie Rhodes. Hi, Annie. You're one of our very, very few female viewers. I think my statistics show I have like 96% male and 4% female. So you're a very valued viewer, Annie. Thank you very much. She says, with most prices being negotiable, what percentage is a normal discount on the asking price of a yacht? Ah, what a great question. 
that varies absolutely enormously because with brokerage, you have to remember that um, each yacht that I sell is owned by a different owner. And each owner has a different outlook on how much discounts he's willing to give and is um, is in a different financial position. On an odd occasion, you get a distress sale where somebody just wants the boat gone and obviously will offer a big discount. And you can even hear as big a discount as 40% uh, sometimes. When I am the broker, I um, advise the seller not to have an asking price that's too far to the price it'd accept. Because if you do offer a 40% discount, sometimes buyers are a little bit offended uh, because they feel that you're trying it on with them to get more money from them than, than you're prepared to accept. Another super chat, £99.99. Thank you very much, Flying Medic. And no question at all. If you have a question, I'll be very, very happy to, to answer. And then that, along with the offer for dinner in Mayfair, is very, very kind, very generous of you. Thanks, in, thanks very much indeed. I'm, I'm taken aback by that one. And if I've missed your question, please put it in the uh, comments below. Um, there's a question here that's been held back for some reason, and, and YouTube does this. It seems to sometimes think that there's something wrong in a question. It looks okay to me. Oh, no, you know what it is? Corey Clark, thanks for that. I can see it. I don't think anybody else can, but you're basically saying that you can... Um, help me with editing and I really appreciate that um, very, very much indeed. Uh, I do have a video team who I love very dearly and I work with them very, very well. But um, Corey, look at my uh, YouTube, look at my website, yachtsellblog.com, drop me an email, let's stay in touch because even if I'm not able to, to use your services, I may be able to put you in contact with somebody else who can. BB says, David, oh, scrolled down again, hang on. David, some consider Larson as the premier yacht builder. However, do you have a preference between Ocean Co, Fedship and Amels? I have no preference. I really don't. They are all, all absolutely awesome builders. Uh, really, truly, truly wonderful builders. And um, I I think, yeah, I mean, I, I love them all. I've, I've been talking to Larson this week and they were probably the biggest surprise for me because I thought that the builder that literally has built 11 of the 20 largest yachts in the world, I mean, Dilbar, and a German, would be very tough people to get on with. And I thought they'd be very hard and set. They are the loveliest people that you could hope to meet working there at Lurson. I did a few videos for them last year. I made some real friends. Um, I was on the phone to them uh, this week about a future project that we're hoping will come to fruition. Um, so I think, although I love all of those brands, Lurson were the biggest surprise for me that they're such a fun loving and, and, and really lovely group of people. Brendan Cunning says, hi David, great video. Great videos. Thank you, Brendan. Looking at my first motorboat, what are your thoughts on picking up something like a 90-foot Sunseeker Portofino, oh, a 1990 Sunseeker Portofino 31, and refreshing it as cost-effective to enter into the world of boating? I think that's exactly the right thing to do. Exactly the right thing to do. Buy something um, that kind of age, that kind of size, do it up, there's a, a big market for sun seekers of that size and that model. Um, it's not my sweet spot for brokerage um, at all, but I know people who've bought those sorts of yachts. It's a great way to get into yachting. That's a great idea. Do it, do it, do it, and let me know how you got with it, Brendan. I'd really be interested to hear. Javier Costa in there. Hi, David. I don't see many Aston Doe yachts out there, even though they produce some nice 120, 200 foot steel hull super yachts. Why is that? Um, you're absolutely right. And you know what? At the I think it was the Fort Lauderdale boat show last year. There was quite a large Aston Doe there on display. 
it looked fantastic. It looked very imposing. I didn't get time to go on board. And Astondoa are one of the builders that I really have in mind that I need to find out more about because they're an interesting yard. Um, they're built not too far away from Alicante, which I go to, as you know, regularly, or I will start soon to go to regularly to document the construction of the Hansteiger trimaran. Um, so I wish I could give you more information. All I can say is they don't build that many yachts. They're not like, you know, Sunset and Ferretti Azimuth that are just building lots and lots of them. Aston though, have a more contained production, um, which is probably why you don't see so many of them around. Um, and also, can I be really honest with you? They they haven't put the money into marketing. You know, you look at the marketing Sunseeker does as an example, or, or you know the other brands I've just mentioned. They really push themselves. Aston Doe don't seem to do that much on marketing, and you know, maybe they've got a reason for that. I don't know. Another super chat in. Daniel, thank you again, my friend. Uh, Thirty dollar uh, super chat. Thanks, Daniel. What do you think about Van Dutch? I really love their aesthetics. But I've heard they're not very good in the mechanical aspects. Um, I'd love to give you a very thorough answer to that. But I feel bad that I really can't. I mean, I know the brand. Their marketing is fantastic. Uh, I don't think I've been in a Van Dutch. Um, but I've had no feedback, really, on Van Dutch, either good or bad. I really like their marketing that they do. That's that's as much as I can say. Um, I think the best thing to do is to talk to somebody who, um, yeah, to talk to somebody who's actually run one and, and, and used one, and they can comment on the, the mechanics. I will say this, Daniel, that usually when a company has big problems like with mechanics or build quality. I get to hear about it pretty quickly because it's kind of the talk on the dock and you mention Van Dutch and people go, oh, awful boat. I've never heard negative feedback on, on Van Dutch. Um, I wish I could give you a more thorough answer, but that's that's the best that I can do, I'm afraid, um, on that subject. Making my way down, second star to the right, what an unforgettable name. Thank you for tuning in again. What are your feelings on Sunreef and how do you feel about carbon fiber hulls versus fiberglass hulls noise? Aha, second star to the right. I don't know who you are, but you have some insight into yachting, I would say. Um, Sunreef I like very much. I like the way they're going. Um, they have got some great products. Actually, uh, I mentioned Denison Yachts earlier. They're just having great success with uh, a video they've published of a, a sunroof called Aria, um, which is for sale, uh, and it looks fantastic. But the most interesting part of your question is that about carbon fiber holes versus fiberglass holes with noise, because you're absolutely right. Carbon, the biggest challenge with carbon fiber is it transmits vibration and noise, uh, and the vibration is a real problem. However, if the yacht builder goes into the build aware of that problem, there are things that they can do about it. And more and more yachts are using carbon fiber. Actually, tomorrow I'm publishing a vlog about the Pershing 8X, which is a carbon fiber yacht. And knowing Pershings as I do, they'll have taken serious measures uh, to um, eradicate or much reduce the, the noise and vibration on board. So it can be a problem if the builder doesn't know what they're doing. If they know what they're doing, uh, it shouldn't be a problem. And actually, I'm hearing more and more people saying that building with carbon fiber doesn't cost necessarily more than building with fiberglass. So I think we're going to see more and more carbon fiber yachts appearing on the scene. Um, BB, David, where, where can one get yacht schematic posters like the terrific one you have to your right hand wall? You know, I should start selling these. I get that asked so often. I'll forget the mugs. Mugs can be gone. I'll sell uh, yacht posters. Um, yeah, I don't know, to be honest. That was given to me by a yacht designer. Uh, so if you know a yacht designer, I don't know, maybe I should buy like a hundred of them or something and sell them, sell them online. Uh, but yeah, usually yacht designers will have hundreds of these. And I was lucky enough to be given that by Dan Leonard of Nouvel Laurie Leonard, who's one of my uh, all time favorite yacht designers. 
Thanks, Rudy. You've left a very nice comment. It's great to listen to such a passionate gentleman. I wish you all a good weekend. No reason to apologise for your English. It's perfect. Um, I'm going to take another two and then it's time to sign off, I'm afraid. Michael N. Is it possible to sell our prototype total eco-friendly yacht design, which we just finalised this month, as a graduate student? If yes, how and where? To sell your prototype total eco-friendly yacht design. Um, you know, it's, it's impossible for me to say whether you can sell it without having seen it. Uh, feel free to drop me a, an email, Michael. I'll take a look at it if you'd like me to take a look at it and give you my comments on it. Uh, you can find my email address on my website, which is yachtsforsaleblog.com. Uh, get in contact with me. I'm happy to... to talk to you about it. I'll tell you in advance, I, I get so many emails, uh, which is really, really nice, that sometimes I have to give quite a quick answer. So um, depending on what I'm doing, it, it, you know, don't expect a big lengthy answer, but do feel free if you'd like me to take a look at it to, to get in contact by email. Javier Costa Hendere. Thank you, David. I'm from Barcelona and spent summers in Costa Brava. Even here in Spain, Aston are quite rare, but thank you for the info about marketing. Thank you, Javier. I hope to spend more time in Barcelona this year. Um, wonderful place. It's possibly my most favourite city on earth. And it's also where Igor Lobanov Yacht Design is based, um, which is uh, an amazing yacht designer. Uh, we've had another super chat. Uh, don't end the stream. No. <laughs> That's very kind. Yeah, I'll keep it going in another few minutes, OK? Uh, as long as there's a few more questions. Thanks again for the super chat. That's very much uh, appreciated. Um, Stevie Stevens Ottero. David, what do you think about 15-year-old super yachts between 80 to 100 feet? I've seen good prices between two and three million. Uh, yeah. 15-year-old uh, would be 2005 uh, build. And there are some great deals out there in that size range and at that price range i i would not hesitate to buy a 15 year old yacht of that size and for that price i'd be looking at i think people who know me well know that i'm a big fan of the freddy custom line 94 what a great yacht they i don't want to say they don't build them like that anymore but it is one of those yachts that make you come out with an expression like that there's so much volume such great engineering such a great yacht such a great, great yacht. Find yourself a Freddy Custom Line 94 from round about that era. Um, actually, you know what? It would be older than 15 years because they'd already transitioned to the 97 in uh, 2005. But yes, I'm all for people buying those sorts of yachts. Philip Tier asks, are running costs really 10% of the yacht value? Wouldn't secondhand yachts have higher running costs then? I assume it would be relevant to uh to when it's the original price or you're absolutely right philip uh running costs vary enormously enormously according to the age the size of the yacht people do say rule of thumb is 10 percent and you know sometimes it does come out at 10 percent other times it doesn't uh i um i remember talking to the skippers of 250 foot yachts with very similar volumes and one was being run on almost two and a half million a year, which in my opinion was outrageously high. The other was on about 1.2 million a year. I mean, what a huge difference. And, you know, in my opinion, the one that was being run for less was also being run better, which is why I'm not naming what the yachts were. But, um, yeah, I mean, running costs can vary enormously, absolutely hugely. Another super chat. Thank you again, Daniel. This is really, really generous of you. When you buy an older vessel, 15 to 20 years old, what are the major things one should be looking for? Um, when you survey the yachts, and as you know, I'm a, I'm a broker, I'm not a surveyor, but I do have some experience with, with surveyors. I would be asking the surveyor to, um, when he looks at the mechanics of the yachts, to do oil and fuel samples. Uh, because you can tell from that a lot about the condition of the engine itself as to how clean the oil and fuel samples are. And they take sometimes over a week before you get the samples back. 
but it's a, a absolutely um, valuable exercise to do. Also, I would really want to see the service history of the yacht through the years. It's a massively important thing because a 15 to 20 year old yacht can sometimes be better than a two year old yacht if it's been run properly. And um, you should be able to have all of the service history. As a matter of fact, the vast majority of yachts in that sort of, in, in the say 100 foot size range are run with MTU engines. And MTU are quite remarkable. You can go to them and you can tell them the serial number of the engine and they can tell you the service history going back all of that time. They can tell you every detail of those engines. So I'd look at that. I'd look as well at the condition of the cabinetry because particularly production yachts have a problem that uh, cabinetry can go milky in colour. And there's lots of theories as to why that happens. My theory is the right one, of course. And I'm pretty sure I'm right on this. Um, in the days when yacht builders were producing more yachts than they could really handle because the demand was so great, a lot of the yachts, was a, a lot of the cabinetry was high gloss. And to get that high gloss effect, you'd put on a layer of gloss, you wait for it to dry, you put on another layer, you wait for it to dry and so on and so forth until you get this amazing high gloss finish. However, in the rush to get yachts out, sometimes the one layer wasn't allowed to completely dry out before the next layer was put on top. The result of that is over the years, the um, moisture starts to come out and it manifests itself in this milky color on wood. And depending where that milkiness is, it can be very expensive to put right. I mean, some people actually choose to just clad those wooden panels in leather or some other material, and it looks actually rather nice on the yacht. But yeah, I would, I'd, uh, in answer to your question, I'd be looking at service records, absolutely service records. Um, I'd be looking at um, the condition of the cabinetry. And um, I think as well, I'd want my lawyer to handling the contract to particularly dig deep into whether the yacht has any debts, because, and, and I, I don't remember all the details here, so I can just give you an overall answer to it. Um, but a, a debt on a yacht is carried by the yacht rather than the owner of the yacht. And so, and sometimes it can come out at the most unexpected time. And if you're now the owner um, of, a, of a yacht that 15 years ago didn't pay its bills in a marina, uh, you may suddenly, that may really come back and bite you in the ass. So, um, so I would also want a particular, I would, would want a good lawyer really digging into that and making sure that it was completely free of debt um, on that, on that. So that's my answer, Daniel. Thanks for all the super chats. I really appreciate it. Um, and that's it. We'll end on that super chat. Thank you all so very, very much. I enjoy this more every time that we do it. It's great to see a growing uh, audience as well. Hope that uh, hope that you're learning as well something from the breaking into brokerage uh, perspective. And I'll see you all next week, same time, same place. Thanks once again.